I am Heidi Benjaminson, your host of Confidence Coaching, a podcast for mothers who want more peace and less worry. Life isn't a spectator sport. Success comes to those who show up every day with a pocket full of courage, grit, and a little sparkle. I'm glad you're here. Hello, hello. Welcome to episode 151, Stay in Your Lane series. And this episode is about our lane. Welcome to my listeners. I am so glad you're here. How are you? I'm looking out at a beautiful Carolina blue sky and I'm feeling great. Now, please hit subscribe and rate and review this podcast if you have the time. I appreciate those who share episodes that are helpful with family or friends. Today begins a 12 episode series. I think it's going to be 12 episodes in which I go back to basics or the new basics, where I introduce the foundation concepts and tools that I use with clients. This has evolved over the four plus years I've had my business. I teach these concepts now with much more nuance and incorporate more of the science and experience that I've gained. I've learned what is most useful with my clients, gotten feedback and modified tools to teach them in a way that makes sense and is much more relatable. So these episodes will go back to the basics. And while I say basics, I actually want you to realize these are the concepts that matter most. All of these episodes, these concepts are important to understand before any growth, any real lasting change can take place. If you are listening with paper and pen handy, draw a picture. If you're driving, and listening as I usually do, well, create a mental picture and draw it when you get home. We're gonna add to this drawing with each episode. I'm a very super visual person. That's how I learn, so I'm always teaching in a visual way. Draw two lanes on a road with a smaller lane or space between those two lanes. This is your channel of influence. We're gonna talk about that in depth in the third episode, but that's what's in between the two lanes. So you're gonna have two lanes on each side and then that empty space, um, that channel between the two. Now, pick the lane which is yours. Whenever I do this, mine's always on the left. Yours can be on the right, but regardless, you are one lane and everyone else is the other lane. Everyone has their own lane. And next week, I'm going to talk about other people's lanes. Our lane is what we are responsible for. Our lane is what is going on inside of our body. It is how we experience the world. Our lane is driven by a wheel that is made up of what we think, the emotions and the feelings we have, our actions and how we show up in the world, and what we create for ourselves. This wheel is constantly moving in our mind, in our body, consciously or subconsciously. Every day we have thousands and thousands of thoughts, and I have really good news. We are not our thoughts. Our thoughts are like a million visitors coming to our front door, and we have the power to decide if we want to let the thoughts in, entertain them, and let them stay, or just let them pass by and leave. Our goal is to constantly have the awareness of these thoughts, these opinions that we have, beliefs, some thoughts, maybe things that we've heard our parents say for years, beliefs that we've been raised with from our culture, our religion, our education. As I work with clients, they get more and more comfortable being aware of what they're thinking. We aren't always taught to identify what we think, maybe because teachers and authority figures only know what they're thinking and make assumptions about what others think. And next week, we'll talk more about assuming about another person's lane because we all do it. It's important to know your beliefs. Your thoughts are inside your lane. It's our job to manage what we think. Other people, teachers, leaders, spouses, anyone, politicians, they all reside outside of our lane. Even though other people may think they are right, and I say that in quotes, or think one way of living or thinking is superior to yours, we have every right to silently in our minds think, I don't agree with you. 
I get to choose what I think. And guess what? We don't have to say this to others if we don't want to, which most of the time it's not useful to. It's our job to manage what we think, and it isn't our job to manage what other people think. Years ago, I was in a lecture and the presenter said something with quite conviction. They were in a position of authority. And in my mind, I thought, I don't agree. I don't think that's true. And I actually stopped paying attention to the rest of the lecture, but it didn't really bother me. I just let it pass by. A few weeks later, my husband, who had been with me, brought the topic up and said he didn't like or agree with that opinion that had been shared, which again had been presented as a truth to the world. And I said, oh, you know, I remember that. And I told myself, I don't agree. I don't think that's true. And then I just ignored the rest. It didn't bother me. I didn't dwell on what was said. I gave myself authority over my own mind, over my beliefs. I gave myself agency, which I've always had, but the agency to choose what I think and what I want to focus on. We never want to delegate this responsibility to other people. Even if others are perceived as experts, we get to choose if we agree or don't agree. And as we grow and mature, it's important to evaluate what we're taught as children, to evaluate if we like how we feel and act when we think certain sentences in our head. Does holding on to a certain belief help me show up as the person I want to be? Does it help me become the person I want to become? As I've made changes to my health, I have had to and continue to work on my thoughts about who I am. Our identity resides in our thoughts, not in what someone else thinks about us, not in how we are categorized on a form. I never thought of myself as an athlete or as someone who was active for like 25 years of my life. I started making real permanent changes when I decided to change my identity, to change what I thought about myself. Now, that is work I've done for 20 years, and for the next week while I'm on vacation in a hotel, I'm automatically packing exercise clothes for each day because I am someone who exercises regardless of where I am. It's who I am, and it's become that because of what I've been thinking. We want to always be watching what we're thinking because this is what we tell our brain to find evidence for. If we think the world is against us, we will find evidence for all of our bad luck. If we think the universe is working in our favor, we're going to find evidence to support that. Now, all of this work is what runs in our lane. Our thoughts create what we feel, what emotions drive our body in our lane. Often we are less aware of what we're thinking and we're more aware of what we're feeling. Our emotions are influenced by what is going on in the world around us. Our emotions are are influenced by the chemicals in our brain, in the lenses and experiences we have had. Our emotions are influenced by any perceived or real threats in the world. And we sometimes say this is going into survival mode. Emotions are not good or bad, even though some feel better in our bodies than others. Emotions are good road signs, good data, to help us understand what is going on in our life, in our body. Our feelings are how we experience life. So we don't want to ignore them. And we also don't want to give emotions too much power. They just are. Our emotions are our responsibility to manage. I can't emphasize this enough. And it's repeated work that I do with my clients. It's okay and normal to be angry but it's our responsibility to manage our anger and be responsible for how we act with that anger. It's okay and normal to be excited or lonely or overwhelmed, all of the emotions. It's our responsibility, no one else's, it's our responsibility to manage our excitement and loneliness and overwhelm. And we are responsible in our lane for the actions we take and don't take from these emotions. As humans, we're going to experience the entire spectrum of emotions. We don't want to go numb from any emotions. Emotions are not to be fixed. In today's world, we're fed messages that happiness and feeling good should be our goal. And in the world of 2023, when I'm recording this, we have 
instant access to instant pleasure, which are lower brain desires by default. So if we encounter any discomfort, any sadness, there are so many ways to numb this emotion from social media, shopping, food, pornography, over-exercising. We have to stop and ask ourselves, is this a productive way of managing this emotion? Or am I creating bigger problems in my life by numbing and avoiding this? Taking a walk, doing something physical is an incredibly healthy way to handle stress, but it isn't healthy if we need to run 10 miles a day at the expense of maybe time connecting with those we love or whatever the cost may be. Taking a bath when overwhelmed may be useful, but do we do this to avoid the discomfort of making all the difficult phone calls or whatever it may be? Our daily work is recognizing, how am I handling the emotions I'm feeling now as a human? Am I taking responsibility for what I'm feeling? And do I like what those feelings are fueling me to do to create? We sometimes think that something or someone else is making us feel a certain way. Yesterday, I saw a disturbing video on the internet from the latest, oh, such sad, devastating school shooting. My heart was wrenched. I was super sad. Those feelings don't feel good. And also, I want to be someone who is very disturbed and sad by those murders. I want to be someone who is frustrated that we haven't done more to stop these tragedies. While it doesn't feel good, I want those emotions because they mean I'm human. As my children leave for college and then share loneliness or discouragements, I want to also feel human emotions like sadness and disappointment. And I want to always remember my body is creating those emotions and they aren't problems to fix. They are road signs and data to help me understand how I'm responding to people in their lanes, to help me understand how I'm being influenced. I don't understand when people try to put others down by saying, oh, she's just so emotional. Somehow that's always used as a put down on women. But here's the honest truth. We're all emotional. We all just show these emotions in different ways. And it may make some people uncomfortable to be around people who show their emotions in bigger ways. But in contrast, stuffing down or ignoring emotions is incredibly unhealthy and always creates bigger problems in our life in the future. Please don't be afraid of your emotions. Through this series, I will help you understand more of how to manage your emotions and also how to stop trying to manage others. In future episodes, I'm going to talk more about repelling emotions and attracting emotions. Okay, moving around our wheel in our lane, we go from thinking to our feeling, now to our actions, to our doing. Our emotions fuel us to act or avoid acting. We're always responsible for how we act. Emotional maturity is being responsible for everything we say, everything we do, how we treat others if we say yes or no to doing things. We can get mad at traffic and yell. We just have to know this yelling is a reflection of us, of our lane. It isn't a reflection of other people. If we are kind to a nice person, our kindness is a reflection of us. If we are rude to a rude person, our rude behavior is a reflection of us, since our action is driven by our emotions. Now, of course, We may like the rude reaction that we give, and yes, we are influenced by how others act. I'll talk more in future episodes about mirroring and how others do in fact influence us. Ultimately though, we are responsible for our reactions. When we blame others for how we act, we're metaphorically letting other people drive in our lane. We're saying they have control of our wheel. This is what we don't want, and we especially don't want to blame our teenagers for how we act. We're the adults. It's our responsibility to model being anchored, being calm, being in control. Now, if you're like me, you're going to act in ways you don't like. You are going to blame your kids for how you act, and then you'll get control and assess what happened. Guess what? This is normal. This means you're human, like me. Our lane includes the responsibility to apologize, to show our family, to show everyone else in their lanes near us that we can own our flaws, that we can be humble, 
that we can pivot and repair what we have done. When our kids see us do this, they learn it's okay for them to slip up and how to take responsibility. If you have to apologize, say, I am sorry I did this. It isn't how I like to handle that situation. Always own how you felt and acted. Do not blame that on others. And if that's hard to do or you aren't in control yet, hold off apologizing until every word and sentence is you taking full responsibility of the wheel in your lane, the wheel of your thinking, emotions, actions, and who you are and who you want to be. Our kids need to see that we're continuing to try and improve in our lane. Often clients will identify something they did and we then figure out the rest of the wheel. What feelings fuel that action? And over time, they get awareness of the thinking and beliefs behind it. I also love the idea. I think I've heard this from Dr. David Schnarch, that we can act our way into a new way of thinking. Our wheel of control in our lane, it doesn't always start consciously with our thinking. I saw this in my own life, again, using the example of getting healthy, of exercising every day, of making different food choices. As I committed to certain behaviors, as I monitored my food, I began to think about myself as someone who controls their food. As I tracked my points like I did 20 years ago on a paper tracking system in Weight Watchers, so funny to think of tracking with paper and pen, as I did that, I acted my way into thinking about myself as someone who is conscious and aware of their choices. I didn't see myself as someone who could wake up early at that time until I started waking up early every single day and started seeing myself as that person. Start the behavior you want to adapt, then start telling yourself every day, I am a person who does this. Right now, I am consciously telling myself and proving to myself with my actions that I am someone who eats a big salad every day. I'm reinforcing this identity in my thoughts and also with my actions. Our thinking, feeling, and doing all comes together to show us who we are becoming, what we are creating for ourselves. It's a perpetual cycle, this wheel. Confidence is anchored in taking responsibility for this daily cycle. Who do I want to be today? Who do I want to be in this difficult work meeting? Who do I want to be when I'm interrupted at home? Who do I want to be when I catch my teen vaping or having sex? Who do I want to be when my neighbor is rude to me? We are anchored. We have complete control of our life, of our lane, when we focus on what we can control. I'm going to spend an entire episode talking more about the lenses we have for our wheel, the lenses through which we see the world. But I want to touch on it here. We all see the world through different lenses. We all have such varied life experiences, opinions, socioeconomic situations, racial, religious, and other influences that create different lenses of the world. Unless we change and heal certain lenses, These beliefs, opinions, and values will be the driving forces behind how we experience the world. This is why the world has people with such varying opinions about everything. And we need a world with diversity, with a variety of perspectives. We are stronger for this. Confidence comes in recognizing that we have certain lenses, certain opinions, that we don't get to be right for other people and judge their lane. Confidence is I get to decide what's right for my lane, and I want to understand why someone is making different decisions in their lane. Regardless of what we can see about another person, we can never see what's gone through their life, what has formed the deep grooves in their lenses. Compassion and curiosity and a desire to understand others makes us much more enjoyable travel companions. I'll talk more and give more examples of that in a few episodes. Okay, in our lane, we are responsible to identify what we need and figure out how to get this need met, maybe by asking for help or figuring it out ourselves. It is not the responsibility of our spouse, of our children, or anyone else to see what we need and meet that need. First, they can't read our mind. And we don't want to be dependent on others to see what obstacles, what potholes we have in our lane. They are busy enough trying to solve the potholes in their lane. 
Learn to identify what you need. This can be hard if we've grown accustomed to only helping others with their needs. And our culture can make women feel like they shouldn't have needs, that it's quote selfish or whatever that means for us to do things for ourselves. Guess what? This is one big gigantic lie and I want to shout from rooftops. Women have needs. Our children need, like desperately need to see us filling our needs. They need to see us valuing ourselves enough to ask for what we need. They need to see us taking naps if we need to sleep. They need to see us saying no if our calendar is full. They need to see us making a list of what we want for our birthday, maybe even ordering it and telling them that you'd love them to wrap it up. I get the best Mother's Day presents, usually a new pair of running shoes, because I go and buy the new pair and hand it to my family to give to me. They have no idea what color I'm admiring at that time. They don't know when I need a new pair of maybe workout tights. If my needs are being fulfilled, my kids feel a sense of safety and security because I'm not putting out insecure vibes that they need to take care of me. And because of this, they actually are very sensitive and aware of what's going on. In our lane, we are responsible for our own self-growth and self-development. If we want to learn a new hobby, if we want more education, if we want a promotion at work that requires additional skills, we have to identify this, then seek ways to fill it. Of course, that might include asking someone for help, but it's our job to identify what we want and take action to make it happen. In our lane, we're responsible to validate that we are a good mother that we are a good person, that we matter. Yes, it feels good when others tell us this and we can accept that compliment. We do wanna surround ourselves with people who uplift us and see the best in us. Ultimately though, it's our responsibility to validate our choices, validate how we handle obstacles. No one else can see our entire lane. No one else knows our life experiences. So ultimately we want to look internally for validation. We will perpetually be insecure if we need external validation to feel whole. Confidence is knowing the final word on our value, on our worth, comes from inside. Notice the people around you who calmly navigate the world with quiet confidence. They know who they are. They aren't desperately seeking external validation and reinforcement. They may ask opinions or get suggestions, but they can make decisions and back themselves up on these decisions. In our lane, it's our responsibility to develop an awareness of how our actions, how the handling of our lane impacts others. We're responsible to be as kind and compassionate as we can be to others, because guess what? It's going to feel a lot better to us. And this is who we ultimately want to be. We are not responsible to swerve around and solve everyone's problems and make everyone happy. That actually isn't confidence or compassion. That's controlling and manipulation. We want to support others, to assist others, but not control them. Awareness of my own biases of how I show up when feeling certain ways Awareness of how I handle certain situations has been a game changer for me. For example, much of the work of dismantling racism for me in the small extent that I have is to admit that my lens of the world is so very different from someone else's lens. To be a compassionate friend to someone in their lane, I have to recognize we both see the world different and neither of us is right or wrong. With regard to our children, we are responsible to teach them, to love them, to support them, but we are not responsible for all of the choices they make. We are not responsible for their ability to synthesize and learn from what we teach them. We are forever insecure if we use what they create in their lane as the barometer of our value, of if we have been good parents. We are responsible to learn from the lessons in our lane And our children need to feel that we have confidence that they can handle their lane, which means giving them space to learn and grow without our hovering. Now, I'll talk more about that in future episodes and exactly what that looks like. These are all of the high level areas of responsibility in our lives, of our lane. 
Life will throw us curveballs. We're going to roam a little out of our lanes from time to time or daily. The key is returning as quickly as possible to being in control of our lane. We do this by asking and answering, what can I control right now? Where am I trying to control others and I need to focus back on my feelings and actions? We return to our lane by asking, who do I want to be in this situation? How do I want to act around these people? Where am I not taking responsibility and where do I need to start taking responsibility? This is true empowerment. Victims want to blame everyone around them for their life, for their situation. They want to release control of their lane to others. If you aren't used to taking this much responsibility, as I've described in this episode, if this wasn't modeled to you, or if you have a lot of people in your life who want to manage your lane, take these things slowly. Start with small daily things. Start identifying your needs and then fill those needs. Notice what you're feeling and repeat to yourself, I am feeling lonely. I am feeling hope. I'm feeling tense. I'm feeling joyful. Make a list of what you think about yourself, who you are. How do you define you? And do you want to be defined this way? We don't want to delegate to anyone else what our identity is, our sense of who we are. That comes from the threads that make up our core. It comes from internal, not external. And as we are confident in who we are, as we confidently manage our lane, we project confidence that others can manage the responsibilities in their lane. Now that's it for this week. Next week, we'll be talking about other people's lanes. Please share this podcast if it was helpful with you. Also, feel free to email or DM me if you would like a full episode on a topic that I touched on here. I may or may not have it planned, and I want to explain as many topics and give as many examples as possible. I'm always open to suggestions. If you would like personalized, weekly, private, one-on-one coaching to learn how to confidently stay in your lane, sign up for a consult call at HeidiBenjaminson.com. A confident mother is the greatest gift to her family, not a perfect mother. Our families want us to feel confident, anchored, and calm. I can help you uncover this version of yourself. Have a great week.